I don't know. Nobody, I never thought that I'd be writing a book or doing research on somebody like any black like anybody, but it's kind of strange how, how this came about. I was reading a book that was published, I think in 2010. Um, ever read this book? It's called From Sea to Shining Sea. Um, it was a bestseller and it was supposed to be really, really good. And I enjoyed reading it. Um, I have a degree in history. I, I taught American history for um, about, well, 15 years total. I also taught German and I grew up speaking German. So I have a little hard time with some words, but um, anyway, I did pretty good. This was a very enjoyable book until I got to its end. And then I got to be a little upset. And why is this not working now? Okay, it's not advancing. Let me go get help. The other time we had to move the pointer off it on your mouse. You had to move your mouse to make it work. Was yeah, oh, there a problem? Yeah, it's my pointer's not working. Now. Well, and um, Alice, if you'd help him, he, we can see all the slides on down the left hand side. He, I, I don't think he's in the presentation view, if, if that is the right words to use. Well, we were going to keep this so I could see what's coming up. Oh, OK. But there you the go. Problem, the problem is it was advancing a while ago, and now it isn't. Good. No, it, it, it won't advance. What was it, uh, Dr. Lindley, you were saying they needed to, the what mouse do? It was timed out or something? Well, the mouse would, the last mouse. time was, the see, it's the mouse. It's kind of you have to move the mouse. Not use this. Not okay. There you go. You know why Aggies have a big ball spot right here? <laughs> <laughs> <I think of> that. <laughs> Sorry about that. I forget instructions sometimes. I was reading a book called um, From Sea to Shining Sea. And it was a nice book. I don't know what I paid for it. And it was pretty entertaining until I got to the end of it. And uh, Robert Leckie wrote something kind of I thought was really disturbing. He described all Texas Rangers as most likely the worst people on earth. And I'm thinking, oh. wait a minute. Um, Gillespie County is named after a Texas Ranger. And so I was, I was, I became curious. I said, was Gillespie one of these persons? Was he one of those that could do that? So um, I started reading every book I could find on, on the Mexican War. Um, every book that dealt with Spanish Texas, Mexican Texas, Mexican history dealing with Texas. Um, I read them all. I eventually, over the next 10 years, read over 500 books uh, on, on Texas history um, because I felt like I wanted to be acquainted with, with all of the aspects. I didn't want to just do one book. So um, there were over 7,000 volunteers from Texas that um, fought in the Mexican War. I want to show you this guy's bibliography. It is two full pages. That's it. And this is a bestseller. He's got two books that he read that he references on the Mexican War. One was published in 1950. And so I don't know why he didn't read anything else. The other one's about 1996, um, pretty recent. Um, anyway, um, that's what triggered this entire search. So 7,000 Texans volunteered out of the 73,000 volunteers that, that joined this. And they were led by this guy. He was Governor J. Pinkley Henderson. Um, in looking at all the 7,000 volunteers, there were very few former Texas Rangers. Now, Texas Rangers were the guys that were actually in the Ranger Force. They were patrolling the, the, the frontier. And they were kind of important um, in just protecting the settlers as Texas is, is expanding and moving west. And so when I came to this little ex this little description of Texas Rangers and, and the illustration with it, I was really kind of hmm. Um, this guy 
this guy's writing fiction because most Texas ranchers didn't look like that. And so he doesn't stop there. He starts talking and describing them. He says, you know, they're, um, I don't know how you pronounce it, El Pipio or whatever, um, treating them like that's an endangered uh, species. But it's not a very nice picture of describing Texas Rangers. So then I get to this little paragraph. And he says, Tejanos were not all frontiersmen. What's wrong with that? Texans are not all Tejanos. Tejanos are, are, the, are the people of, um, of Mexican or Spanish descent. So he doesn't even know that Texans are not called Tejanos. So I said, wait a minute. And then he also mentions the college students that volunteered for the war. And I'm going, okay, there was one university at, in Texas in 1845, it was Baylor. And I don't know what it was, it wasn't in Waco at the time, it was kind of trying to assemble itself outside of Houston, but I couldn't find any number of students. So I don't know what this guy is talking about, but it really upset me. So um, if you go back in history, you'll find that the, after the Mexicans won their independence, they're referring to the people in Texas with that nice big word. And I won't even dare try to try to say that, but you can kind of see where Tejano comes in. Fact is, by 1824, the Mexican Constitution refers to all Texans as Tejanos. The problem is, by 1824, there were already about 3,000 Anglos in Texans in Texas. So they were beginning to move in. Actually, I think Mexico was wanting settlers and trying to get them into the into the into the into the area. Um, one out of every ten American that fought in the in the Mexican War was was Texas, or nine and a half percent. So uh, the regular army consisted of just 27,000 men. So the Texans had a pretty sizable. Uh, section of that. Um, I had the pleasure of meeting this, uh, this individual. He's a professor, or was a professor at, at Victoria College. And he looks like he's in a lot of pain, but uh, he, was, he was really a wonderful gentleman. I'm sorry that he passed on. Uh, Dr. Sperlin wrote this book, and he did it before he had a computer. And so they had to type everything and, it, and organize them by, by by companies. I actually entered all these into Excel so I could spread them out and find out you could actually trace where different um, rangers served. But this guy was wonderful. I enjoyed meeting with him. He was kind of encouraging in what I was trying to do. The first battles that took place in the Mexican War took place in, in Palto Alto and Pirate um, Zerezaca de la Palma. Excuse my Spanish, it's not very, very good at all. Uh, any of those dates look familiar to you? <coughs> How about this date? Yeah. For sure. Yeah, Texas. That's the day Fredericksburg was founded. Yeah. That's right. And so um, Moisebach, not Moisebach, it was um, Schubert that was bringing the first settlers. So Curry and I just did a lot of illustrations of these early battles and you always have everybody in uniform. And it was, it was, the, it was the regular army that was involved in these two fights. The volunteers don't show up till later. Now there were two former Texas Rangers that had served with Hayes and had served on the frontier. One of them was Samuel Hamilton Walker. And uh, he was excited about the war with Mexico. He had been a prisoner down in Mexico. He had just escaped, came back to Texas. And he's, he's raring to go fight Mexicans again, but he's not associated with anybody. He just gallops down to the valley and he finds anybody that he can to, to help him. And they have some skirmishes with Mexican troops, but he was there. And we'll talk more about him later. The other one was Benjamin, Mc, Benjamin McCullough. McCullough became a Civil War general. He gets killed in 1862 at, at uh, Pea Ridge in Arkansas. But he was there, but he wasn't there for the fights either, the first two battles. So when um, he was saying that the volunteers were collecting at the border, he's pretty right, but it was after these first two battles took place and there were atrocities. And so my quest was to find out if Gillespie was involved 
in any of the atrocities. Atrocities are not military actions. It's when you go take somebody and shoot them just because of the, obviously the color of the skin, they were Mexican. And that's what set me out on this quest to find out. So um, they did take place. The question is, was Gillespie involved? One of the future Civil War generals uh, that was there was so disgusted with the behavior of the volunteers that start showing up at the border uh, that he almost quit. He turned in his uniform. Uh, he was very upset about it. It was not the way that, he, that anybody was supposed to fight. So uh, this is what uh, Lakey wrote. And the problem with that is, I don't know where the town is. Maybe it's um, Aqua Nueva, I don't know. Um, but this is what he says. Um, question to me became, was Gillespie involved in this? Did they attack this ranch? Was he there when they killed all these? And they did kill quite a few Mexicans. This did happen, but it didn't happen until later. And so uh, Gillespie arrived in, on the first time he arrived on the border was in March. Now the war didn't start till May. And he's actually sent by agents of Pope to go create problems, to start a war. And he marches down to Laredo. Laredo was still flying a Mexican flag and he captures the city of Laredo and raises the American flag. So he does that, but it, he can't get anybody to find him. Nobody's shooting. And so he goes back to San Antonio, but he has accomplished something, and, but there's no war. And um, there are illustrations of the atrocities that took place at this little village. Uh, notice the stripes on the pants. Those are the stripes of the, of, the, of the US Army at the time. So you don't see any Rangers in that um, illustration, but it is pretty dramatic. Um, and Lakey describes it like this, and um, they were taking the guys out and shooting them, they were raping the women, they were killing everybody. And there's another illustration of what the scene looked like. Again, notice that those are all U.S. Army uh, uniforms that they wear, so you don't see any big floppy hats, you don't see any Texas Rangers with pistols strong necessarily, and so it's kind of confusing. Um, there were 36 Mexicans killed. This did happen. And then, of course, at the bottom, it says the Tejanos rode off to fresh scenes of blood. He still doesn't realize that Texans are not Tejanos. And so I wonder sometimes about these people that write bestsellers. This guy's written, I don't know, 50 books. Um, looking at the bibliography text, really two full pages. So he didn't really do his, his research on this, but he blames it all on the Texans and all on the Texas Rangers. Now, if you dig carefully, you'll find some diaries. And one diary from an Illinois officer did, did point out that all those people involved in this massacre were people from Arkansas. So the Arkansas volunteers were also capable of committing atrocities. And most of this kind of stuff was hushed up. You just didn't really see much of it in print. But um, Leckie wasn't alone. Here was another guy called Thomas P. Atheridge. And he writes that the worst offenders were the Texas Rangers. So he's labeling all those 7,000 veterans that from Texas as rangers, and you just, one just cannot do that. So you kind of start wondering about these people and doing their research. Uh, he claims Jack Hayes, who was John Hayes, was uh, Gillespie's captain in San Antonio. Very, the most famous Texas ranger of them all is Jack Hayes. Jack Coffee Hayes was Andrew Jackson's son-in-law by marriage. Um, so, um, 36 people did get killed back to that same little village right there. And this is 2018. Why are these people making this mistake as recently as 2018? So again, Gillespie didn't arrive on the border until around July the 4th. We know that because he got drunk and he appeared before he was hauled before Taylor himself. And here's this 
captain of the Texas Rangers. He's totally out of his mind. He's insulting to everybody. And they said, well, we'll just take him to the general. The general does nothing with him. He put him, lock him up overnight and then turned him loose because he's got quite a reputation at the time. So uh, I'm trying to figure out where, where did Gillespie come from? And I thought, let's find out where they came from initially. And of course, the first Gillespie that we find on record was this guy, James Gillespie. He was born in Scotland. Uh, he married a Jenny, a Jeanette Stewart. And he actually came to the United States to Fisherville, Fisher, sorry, Fisherville, Virginia. And this is where Fisherville is located. And I did a little more research and I found that he had a, a son. This is William Gillespie. He grew up or was born in Ulster, Ireland. About 30% of the of the of the, um, the the Presbyterians in Scotland. Man had a had a flee to Ireland, and I'll tell you why in a minute. And he married a Mary. How do you pronounce that? I'm really good at English words, but anyway, you can find more statistics. And then I came across this one: John Gillespie, born in 1786. He marries a Patsy Houston, who is the daughter of Isabella Houston and the sister of Robert Houston, who is the grandfather of Samuel Houston. I finally have a link between the Gillespie's and the Houston's. It took me quite a while to find this. Fact is, I found 17 marriages between the Houston's and the Gillespie's, and I'm I could actually, when I started this, go online and I find family trees uh, put up by people in Tennessee, and I look at all these Houston's, I look at all these Gillespie's, and so there's got to be a link together. Well, I discovered the Gillespie's, wherever the Gillespie's went, the Houston's were sure to follow, or the Houston's followed the Gillespie's, I'm not sure which, but they immigrated together. And they immigrated to Knox County, Tennessee, and here's another, um, this is Robert's uh, mother and father. Um, his, his, his father was married to Martha, Martha Finley Houston, and uh, she died in 1805, the year that he was born, so very likely that's what caused them his, her death. These are Robert Gillespie's uh, older step-siblings, and the oldest was Esther, who um, was a Gillespie, who married Matthew Cyrus Houston, and um, it was uh, Martha Louise Gillespie who married Matthew Cyrus Houston. So you wonder, did they marry, did she marry her brother-in-law? Very likely they did. It was William Finley Gillespie who married another Sarah Gillespie. I don't know where that Gillespie came from. And it wasn't my objective to find out. And the last one up here was James Houston Gillespie, who's the one who is most influential with Robert. Uh, he became a Presbyterian minister. So they were very Presbyterians. They also, um, his father, their father owned some slaves in, in Tennessee. Um, they never farmed. They were always buying and selling land. And land was always cheaper over the border. It was always cheaper somewhere else. Here's the rest of the uh, upper siblings. There was Betsy Ann Gillespie. I don't know what happened to her or John Newton. And it wasn't my interest to find out. Uh, then there is Matthew Milton Gillespie, who was born just two years before uh, Robert himself. And everybody, every record says he came to Texas and was buried in LaGrange. Well, that's not true. There's no Gillespie buried in LaGrange, period. And I've been to all the cemeteries. I've searched all the records. So I don't know where that story came from. And then finally, there's Robert Addison Gillespie. He's the star of our our focal point right here. This is where they came from in in, uh, in in Scotland, and you can see you can see over on the left edge uh, that's Ireland, and um, I don't know how you pronounce that. Kirk Cabright. Um, I went online to have a little pronouncing dictionary, so I still can't understand it. But that's where they lived, and it's not a very attract it's not a very attractive place at all. Uh, do you have churches? Uh, they're all Presbyterians. The village is kind of cute. And the reason why they decided to leave is that you had almost 30 years of, of war going on and it made it very uncomfortable for some people to, to live in Scotland, especially Protestants. And, um, and um, so they just decided to leave. You might be familiar with British history in 1662 was this act of uniformity that kind of hammered together the common book of prayer. And it's kind of, it always gets disastrous when a king or a queen gets involved in trying to, trying to regulate your religion. 
So about a third of the Protestants that lived in Scotland also went to Ireland for a while. And this is the heritage. And it was a little Quaker that gets involved in this. And I know you've seen Quaker pub oats, but this is the guy that had Pennsylvania. And he's, he's, got, the, he's got lots of land and he needs settlers. He doesn't care where they're coming from. He says, come on over. So he's advertising. You can have religious freedom. Just come on over here. So they do. And he's, you know, he says, I'm, I'll take them from any, I don't care what you are, just come on over. He'll even accept Irish, Irish Catholics if possible, so why not? Um, and they do. And the, the nice thing about Philadelphia and Pennsylvania, it's the gateway to the Shenandoah Valley. So they got the Pen Philadelphia and then went south uh, into this beautiful valley. And James and Janet um, Gillespie come over with their four children. They land in Philadelphia. And, in, um, in, um, on the 24th of July in 1740. And then they say, adios, we're heading south to Virginia. And so that's where they wind up and they all go together. They even settled for a short time in Beverly Manor in Augusta County, Virginia. Just to give you an idea where this is, so uh, you can see where Pennsylvania is up there at the top and you see the Shenandoah Valley. And so by coming into Philadelphia, you have access by going Southeast, Southwest into this valley. I don't know if that made people in Virginia very happy, but here's a little closer look. West Virginia, of course, didn't exist at that time, but you can see how the high peace settlers were just pouring in over the Appalachians. So uh, this was called the Great Philadelphia Wagon, Wagon Road, or sometimes the Wilderness Road. Daniel Boone took this route. And a um, little more detailed map so you can get familiar with um, of, of how it all looked. And it's kind of hard to find a, a, a map of the United States at this time, but look at all the states that are claiming lands all the way to the Miss, Mississippi. And you have a lot of people, a lot of states giving up their terms, but you can see Kentucky there at the bottom becomes the state in 1972. Uh, Tennessee is not very far behind in 1796. So, um, this is also where Conestoga wagons come into play. You've heard of those. Well, they're from Conestoga, Pennsylvania, and that's what they're using to get west. They actually existed. Um, the, the Gillespie's and the Houston's were headed to the Middle River, and I'm sorry this map just barely shows part of Mary, Maryville, uh, Tennessee over on the, on the left side, and the, the uh, Maryville is the the county seat of what becomes Blount County. And um, Sam Houston's actually living here in 1811, teaching school. I've been to that schoolhouse. I've been everywhere Gillespie's lived. I've been to his birthplace, went to where he grew up in, in Alabama. I've been, of course, in Texas, all over the place. I even climbed the hill in, in Monterey, Mexico, where he was, where he died or got, yeah, where he got killed. So. Um, this is Tennessee and it becomes a state quite early. Um, you can see just like any other state, it was full of Indians. And so the people moving in have absolutely no problem in pushing the Indians further east. Um, uh, this, these are the eight counties of Eastern Tennessee that want to secede and actually want to form a new state. Ever heard of the state of Franklin? Well, it didn't make it. They somehow Congress said no. You can see Blount County down in the southwest. This is where all the Gillespie's and the, uh, the Houston settled. Um, Gillespie's grandfather um, never farmed. He had, he loved buying and selling land, but he also said, saw opportunity. He says, I'm gonna build flat boats because all these people are coming in. Here's the Tennessee River. And once you get on, on water, you can sail to the Mississippi. So he's building these boats as fast as he can. And people are hopping on the boats and sailing further east. And uh, flat boats were really, really important in American history. And so they loaded everything. I think they're trying to carry some whiskey downstream there a little bit. Uh, there was one major Indian battle that took place and you don't hear much about it. It was called, called the Battle of, of the Horseshoe. Um, it's kind of significant because um, they killed 700 or 800, of, 700 of the 800 Red Stick Indians, ever heard of them? 
I don't know where they are today, but the Jackson, Andrew Jackson was there and he was leading the fight. The Gillespie's were there, uh, the Houston's were there. So they all got to fight, fight together in this little battle. I mean, that's what you did when you moved east. I don't know much about the red sticks, but here's, I found an illustration of what their camp life looked like and it looked pretty, pretty peaceful, but um, it didn't, it, you know, the, Indians have to move on. Robert Sr. is the father of our Gillespie that, that I'm searching. He dies in 1821. He has a store in, in, um, in Somerville, Alabama, and it's a general store. And perhaps this is where people get the idea that, that Gillespie himself was a merchant. And I'll explain that in a little bit into detail later on. Um, Robert Jr. and Matthew Milton are taken in by their older stepbrother that I mentioned earlier. And this is where they lived and I've been there and it's a beautiful house, it's still standing. It's a nice little village, um, nothing of the store is left, but like everybody else in Texas, the panic of 1837 hits. And even in small villages, getting enough to eat or just surviving is, is a crisis. So you'll find cartoons like this, well, cartoons were just getting started, but the panic of 1837 hit everybody and land wasn't worth very much. And so owning a lot of land didn't mean that you were rich. So the Gillespie's and the Houston's aren't doing too well. And so when things don't go well, let's go west a little bit. And James, that's uh, Gillespie's stepbrother, decides to invest in land in Texas. Now land is cheap everywhere. And even when land is cheap, you can also buy land at too high of a price. And that's what he did. He bought 5,500 acres and he says, we're gonna to go to Texas and I'm gonna set you all up in the realty business. And the realty in those days was called real, was mercantile realty. And I, can, I can, can't tell you how many people have, have, have interpreted that, that they had a general store that they were in the mercantile business. And that's just simply not true. So his older stepbrother creates a, a business called Gillespie and Brothers, and he seeds it with 5,500 acres. He takes his little stepbrothers there, says, you're old enough now. Um, you, you live here and you sell this. I'm going back to my flock in Tennessee. After all, I'm a minister, so I have things to do. <laughs> and so they, um, they, they managed, it was all kind of ways to get to Texas in those days. You, this is an ad that ran in 1837. There are steamships plying the, the, the Gulf of Mexico. You get, I don't know that they went to the city of Houston, but I've had so many nice things about Houston. I thought I didn't include it. Uh, here's a little steamer that heads up. Um, there's a bigger one that this is the port of Houston and in Houston is just being formed you know there was um I forgot the two brothers that really sold the land to make Houston the capital but it was a mud hole and it pretty well explains it um the capital was just being built Sam Houston's living there the, the interesting thing is to read what people write about Houston <laughs> this was written by an attorney, William Arnett. Not very flattering, but he's too dumb to leave. He spends the next 26 years in Houston. I thought that was kind of interesting. Here's somebody else that wrote about Houston. Well, it hasn't changed a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think they're serving drinks out of skulls anymore. Do you know where the 5,500 acres was? Uh, it in, in yes. Uh -huh. East Texas somewhere? Yeah, it's in Fayette, Fayetteville, LaGrange. Mm -hmm. Did I say that right? Yeah. That was a ship that, that sank. A hurricane hit the Gulf the year before, so traveling by sea in the Gulf is still dangerous. Um, this is Matagora Bay. The big rumor was that Matagora Bay was going to be the next Galveston Bay and Galveston's booming, everybody's showing up. And so people were buying property in Matagora, Matagora Bay um, on the coast. And then that's the headwaters of the, of the Colorado River. So that's where they decide to go. And uh, a year later, they actually formed the Masonic Lodge there. So this was in 1838. The Gillespie's arrived there in 1837. 
Now it's pretty barren in 2022. If you ever been there and you want to, it's amazing it was any kind of town at all. But they they don't stay long. And this is the this is this is Texas in 1836. So you can see that Bear County is barely civilized, according to the Anglos. This is where the land is. This is where it's free. This is where the settlers are pouring into Texas uh, after the revolution. Um, and Texas gave, the Republic gave anybody that served in the Revolutionary War, um, you, got, you got 640 acres or 320 acres. All you had to do was go out and survey it. Sometimes you had to fight Indians for it, but you had to go mark the territory. You had to chip off some bark. You had to build a mound or something and you had to register it. And Texas, of course, is the only state that has a land office, but the land office wasn't open yet. So they allowed every county to in the, in the, in the country at the time to to take, the, to take the surveys and to register the land. So uh, you had to register and survey your land. And this is a typical survey. This is somebody that's gone out and has measured the, the, the trees or the land that uh, you can see on the right, uh, obviously bounded by a river and a compass was really important um, that we had all that. And so there were certain things that, that you just have you had a half in order to mark a tree. And once you had a description, you could go uh, register it. That's all the things you had to do. A mound of earth, three feet high. How long do you think that lasted after a good rain? But that's, that's how it was done. Uh, these are the instruments that surveyors use. Gillespie's become very interested in becoming a surveyor because they're finding out that they don't want to farm their 5,500 acres because it hasn't been cleared. It's full of ticks and mosquitoes and said <laughs> that's kind of bad too. So they get familiar with surveying. They got to do something. After all, all these other people are coming in and registering their land. So uh, does that look familiar to anybody? Does help? That's Gillespie County. Yeah. Ever wonder why Fredericksburg's not on the Pernanals? How come, you know, Braunfels is founded on the beautiful Comal? How come Fredericksburg didn't get the Pernanals? <laughs> Does that help? Look at those surnames. But they're already all spoken for. And a lot of them are Spanish. I don't know what I'd like to find out, you know, what happened to these people, the, the ones that got the, the like Manchaca down there that got that um, be interesting to see. Um, but that's that's how the surveys. And so um, Robert and Matthew are at home in Fayette County. They got to do something. And so he goes to work. And I know he does because I could go online and see the paychecks that he was getting from online at the general land office. They're still there. And so I could date. I could tell when he was actually working for uh, the state and doing a job recording all these. And he drew a nice salary. I never did add it all up. LaGrange wasn't that hot in those days, but I think it was I don't, it was pretty typical of what was going on today. It's today's courthouse. It wasn't there back then. Uh, so I don't know what, I couldn't find a photograph of the old courthouse. And here's, here's Fayette County. And Gillespie's property are located due south of LaGrange, um, about halfway to the, to the county line. Um, they never do farm it. Uh, they eventually, it, actually, they never even sell an acre. So they've got 5,500 acres. They're supposed to be buying and selling real estate, and they never even buy another acre. And I'm sure the brother, the stepbrother in, in Tennessee is getting a little bit perturbed with them not really going out there and selling land, but he bought it at too high of a price. You can go out and claim it for free. So who's going to pay a dollar an acre? A dollar an acre was outrageous. <laughs> I mean, my dad bought land at a dollar an acre in 1950. Of course, it was in the Ozarks of Arkansas, but and it was an experience, but that's another story. Uh, the Texas Land Office um, is where you filed your claim. And in this case, the county seat was Fayette County. And so the, the, this is the general land office that is eventually built in Travis County. I think it's still standing on the corner of the, um, or did they tear it down? It's been so long since I've been to Austin um, on the courthouse square, I don't know. Well, Sam Houston uh, was the first president. And of course, it's nice when you move into a country and you're 
your second cousin is the president of the company or the governor. This guy is the second president. You know who he is? Michael B. Lamar. Marable. I've just been pronouncing that for 70 years. Say it again. Marable? Marable. Okay, thank you. I learned something all the time. <laughs> That's his famous quote. How do you think he'd get along today? <laughs> well, Fayette County had a civil war, I had a revolutionary war hero living there. His, his name was John Henry Moore. Did you ever hear him? Yes. Yeah. He had a plantation. He had slaves. He liked Lamar's idea. Hey, hey, it's 1839. Let's, let's move west. Let's go kill some Indians. In December of 1839, he organizes an invasion force. Got 63 men, 16 Apaches sign up. They'll always sign up with anybody going west to kill Comanches. They love that idea. And they, they head out. What month is it? What person in their right mind marches west in the middle of winter? He does. It goes into the San Saba Valley. They find an encampment of 500 Comanches. They find where they're camping. They get off their horses. They tie them all up and they tiptoe over to the, to the village. The Comanches aren't stupid. They knew they're coming. They come around, steal all their horses. And suddenly they're on foot and he loses quite a few men. He has to walk back to Austin in the middle of the winter. It was hilarious. And yet this is a, this is a revolutionary war hero. Um, that happened to him, that really happened. I don't know what happened to the two books I wanted to bring. One of them, the best book I've ever read um, at the time was, was this book by T.R. Fehrenbach. You ever heard of him? Brilliant person. I got to meet him. He wrote, or he wrote an editorial every day in the San Antonio Light. He's, he was Mr. Texas history. A delightful guy. He wrote a book called Comanches. And I was unable to bring it because out of my 500 books that I have in my office, I can't find it. Um, but this book is fantastic. If you ever get a chance to check it out of the library, read this book. It is the first decent book written about Comanches, and it'll open up your mind. The second one, if you can pronounce that name. This guy was born in Finland. He falls in love with Texas history. He writes the best book on Comanches ever. Check it out. Mine's missing, too. Um, it is fabulous reading. Um, he came to Texas. He taught at Texas A&M for a while, and now he's teaching in California. I'm sorry we, we lost him. He's, he's brilliant. He's young, and this book is fantastic. I highly recommend, if you're interested in Comanche Indians, read these two. So, well, before we really get started, let's take a look at San Antonio in 1837. Um, Gillespie is living over in Fayette County. He's recording deeds from the from the, for the general land office. <clears throat> but San Antonio is really a fabulous city. It's the only city in Texas that really has some history to it. And you find a lot of old maps and people came in and drew a lot of things. I think Lundquist was a German that came in about the time that Fredericksburg was, was settled and did a lot of sketching. So San Antonio is quaint. It, um, it's, it's scenic, it has the Alamo, has a, has a lot of interesting buildings in it that the rest of the Texas cities just didn't have at this time. So you can see all, you see the missions and you see the little pueblos of the, of the, um, of the, the poor Spanish or Mexicans living in, in San Antonio. And um, for Texans arriving in San Antonio, it had to be a cultural shock. I mean, why are we allowing this to go on? San Antonio now belongs to the Republic of Texas. And they're having this kind of activity on Sunday afternoon and the priests are out there placing their bets. What kind of, what kind of Catholics are these? This is really, really strange. But they love the Fandangos and they tune right in and they can kick up a good two-step or whatever you do at a Fandango <laughs> as, as good as anybody else. The, um, they like this and they love the music and they love the, 
the fiesta, say like that, but this was shocking. The women go bathing in the San Antonio River every afternoon. So if you have an apartment close by, you have a nice view. And I'm not sure I'm gonna ride home to mama about this, but this was really, really neat. Back to the fandangos, you could find a little senorita like this, and boy, was she fun to dance with, and you could really have a good time. And then occasionally you thought about your sweetheart you left home. It was, it was a great place. So Texas in 1839, I found this obituary for Gillespie and I highlighted, highlighted this in yellow because you'll find this nowhere else. And this is what it says. He volunteered working for, because his sympathies lay with, with um, the Federation Party. Ever heard of the Federation Party? Right. Texas, South Texas, this is the, the, um, the Republic of the Rio Grande. South Texas beyond the, below the Nueces was basically unoccupied land. And um, most of Mexico stayed below the Rio Grande, but here's this huge area basically from, from Corpus Christi down to the valley that nobody's living in. And there were several states in Mexico that became unhappy with what was happening down uh, deeper in Mexico City. So they wanted to create a new country called the Republic of um, the Rio Grande. This is their capital building and you can still go visit it in Laredo, it's still there. This is what the state of the Republic of Rio Grande would have looked like. Um, you see the upper states, three states of, um, of below the Rio Grande and then the other area still to be determined. Had they succeeded, I'm sure there'd been a war with, with Texas because Sam Houston and Lamar weren't gonna let all of South Texas go that easy. Well, <coughs> General Antonio Gonzalez, Canales is actually recruiting for volunteers in Texas. He travels to Houston, he travels to Austin, he says, come join us, and why not? This is the only photograph I could find of Canales, and so they just don't exist. But he's recruiting, and he got 300 Mexicans in, 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 in Texas, 140 Americans, a bunch of Indians, all this volunteer. And uh, they even elect a colonel there, Samuel Jordan, to, to lead them. Another colonel was Colonel Reuben Ross. And this is one that Gillespie volunteered for. And there were 200 in this company and they went to the Rio Grande. They fought in several battles. Um, I am not gonna pronounce the Battle of La Cantrera, whatever that is, uh, near Mir, but Gillespie participates in this. And there are always artistic scenes of what the battle looked like. Um, he was very sympathetic for this, uh, caused him to volunteer. Um, who knows what the, what the fighting looks like? It was kind of hard to find. Um, the reason I know that he served is because he was not drawing a paycheck from the general land office during these months. So why does that matter? Because Texas decided to strike everybody's record from the payrolls. I can't find them. I can't find a single, I haven't been able to find a single military service road of anybody that served in the Republic of uh, the Rio Grande. I mean, they perished. They uh, were threatening them with, with basically, um, um, what do you call that when you, you're a traitor? And with, the names were supposed to be published in every Texas newspaper if, if they didn't rescind what they had done. I can't find any retractions or I haven't been able to find any yet. But I know he was, I know that it's true that he fought in this, in these, at those two battles simply because he wasn't drawing a paycheck. Now he's back on the payroll doing work. So um, there are other things happening in Texas. So it's really strange about the Republic of the Rio Grande. I want you to take a look at, at the Comanches. Uh, I've got some other maps to show you in a second. Um, Comanche started out in Wyoming and they decided to head south. And when they headed south, everybody got out of the way, including the buzzards. Uh, they were vicious, the most vicious Indians tribes of, of them all. Even the Apaches left Santa Fe. You can see how they're coming in. Um, San Antonio, 
was founded in 1718. And if you ever wonder why didn't they come up in the hill country sooner, it's because it was controlled by the Comanches. I mean, it, it was, this, this territory was deadly, even to the Spanish. And there again, you see the, the basically the occupation of the Comanches, what they dominated. Uh, it was dangerous to set foot. You can see Santa Fe up there in the, in the Northwest corner. Um, it was huge. This is what you mostly don't see. This is the influence that Comanches had south of the Rio Grande. Take a look at that. Look how far they raided. And they needed to raid. They needed new, they needed females. And so they captured a lot of, a lot of uh, Mexican girls and they needed them. Um, they just needed to replenish their stock. I wish you could wish sometimes they could could have done DNA to see the combination of, of what uh, the Comanches were really like, but you'll probably find a lot of genes. They, they went almost as far as Mexico City. And this is one other reason explains why the Republic of the Rio Grande could be possible. It's because Mexico City really couldn't control the, control the area. So uh, another area that that Indians used a lot. And I think you've heard of the Pinta Trail. If you take the old San Antonio Highway, just not too far over here, you can go all the way to San Antonio. Fact is when you leave Bernie and suddenly the 87 or what was it? 87? Yeah, I-10 opens up. You're in a corridor. That's the Pinta Trail. It's, it's, it's hundreds of years old. This is how the Indians and the early all came up uh, or went uh, through the Edwards Plateau to get below San Antonio. Well, the Spanish founded a mission at San Saba. You ever been there? Menard, 1757. And uh, this is not much left of it, but it's really interesting to, to know that they came up the Pinta Trail that went right through downtown Fredericksburg and out toward Menard. Um, and the, that was going on a hundred years before Moise Bach came up this way. Well. Remember, remember Colonel Moore? His little invasion got the Comanches concerned. So, God, what prompted him to come up here and do that? That's just really, I mean, we taught him a good lesson, but you know, maybe we need to go talk to the Texans. And so why not drop down to San Antonio? And they put the word out and the Texans uh, on, a, on their, um, Lamar said, yeah, come on down, but we want you to bring all the white hostages you see so far. And so they meet in, in San Antonio, the 65 Comanches come down, they bring 12 chiefs and they, they return Matilda Lockhart, ever heard of her? And the Texans aren't real happy to see her because they've sliced off her nose and she's ugly. And apparently Comanches did that just so they wouldn't run away. So they're really unhappy. And they meet at a place called the council house. The council house is the city hall. And so they get them all into the room, 36 Comanche chiefs with their bows and arrows and Tommy Hawks. And they have an interpreter, the Texans do. And so they're all in the room, they shut the door and it says, okay, interpreter, tell them to surrender their arms. And he says, are you kidding me? And he's slowly edging his way towards the door. And so right when he's at the door, he announces to all the Comanches, you gotta give up your arms and he runs out the door because all hell breaks loose after that. Uh, the Comanches don't take that very lightly. They pull out their tomahawks and they start slashing. It is a madhouse. 12 chiefs are slain wow. in that room. 23 Indians are shot outside in the streets. 30 more are arrested. It's a, it's a complete disaster. The Texans are very happy. If you want to go see this side, this is the present side in San Antonio where the council house or city hall stood at that time. Um, we have a lot of images about Indians and, um, you know, in their feathers and in their dress and, and how they look. And this is probably what they looked like. This is a real photograph. They weren't really real impressive. And so I don't know what those looked like that, that went to the council house, but this was pretty typical. These are Comanches. Um, I don't know if I want to get in the same room with them or not. Well, the news of the council house massacre spreads throughout the Comanche uh, villages. And there's another thing you need to understand about Comanches. They didn't have a nation. There is a Comanche nation, but they weren't unified. So what, what happened to your neighboring Comanche tribe if they got slaughtered, 
No, that was their problem. They didn't unify as a whole nation and declare war. So it was kind of interesting when Moore first went up and, and tried to attack the Indian village that the whole nation didn't get upset. They had, they had many, many nations and they really acted independently. So um, Colonel Moore decides, um, uh, well, all right, here's why. So the Comanches are a little upset. So now they're going to teach the Texans a lesson. And so on August 1st, 1840, they spill out of the, uh, the uh, Edwards Plateau about, about San Marcos. And they, they just spill out. They're going to follow the Guadalupe uh, all the way to Victoria. They're raiding all the farmhouses. They're collecting horses. They're cat collecting cows. They're collecting all kinds of goods. They get to Victoria. And by that time, the Victorian people kind of know they're coming. And so they put up a little defense. So they just go around them. And where they're headed is, is, is Matagora Bay. Uh, can you find um, the Guadalupe up there, the upper left, where you see Gonzalez? They're coming down the Guadalupe and they're heading all the way and the south of, southeast of Victoria is, you'll see, Linville. This became a seaport where they had all the warehouses. And Matagora Bay was again supposed to become the next Galveston of Texas. And this is where all the ships came in and there were warehouses were stocked with everything the Texans needed. Well, the Indians show up and all the merchants just go swimming, uh, just get out of their way. And the, the Comanches seize everything. And imagine walking into a warehouse full of all kinds of goodies and they always, they I mean, they stole everything. And this is how you see the Comanches portrayed afterwards. Notice they're wearing a top hat. Sometimes they have a, a coat and tail on and they put them on backwards. What stupid Comanches, what do you know? They don't know anything. But uh, look at how many illustrations there are where you just see these Indians on this Comanche raid dressed up like idiots um, with umbrellas. They don't know what to do with those. And that's not at all. They just, you'll see a lot of this. I don't know if this is racist or not. Um, there again. So they're, they're loaded with loot and they've got everything. They got horses, they got everything they could possibly take. And now they're heading back and they're going back the same way they came. They skirt around Victoria and they get to an area about Lockhart. And at Lockhart, the Texans are finally caught up with them or President Day Kyle or somewhere in that area. And the Texans meet them and they skirmish with them. Um, don't do them much damage. This is, this is um, what it looks like today. Um, majority of the Comanches get back into the hill country with all their loot. Um, Robert Matthew uh, and his brother, Matthew, uh, Robert Gillespie and his brother Matthew show up with Colonel Moore, but they don't get to fight. It's too late. Colonel Moore is always a dollar late on everything, um, but he was there. And now Texans are really upset. What are we going to do about this? Well, guess what? That's all that need Colonel Moore needed was to launch his second invasion of Comanche. So he said, who wants to join and come back up? And guess what? Um, only only um, seven of all those that went with him before decide to join him this time. And I'm not going this anywhere with this guy, but he manages to attract Robert and his brother, Matthew, and they sign up. And Robert is apparently a leader because in those days, you elected your own captain and you elected your own officers. And so Robert uh, Addison Gillespie is elected captain of, um, or so lieutenant of one of the unit of the companies. He has 107 volunteers and they go looking for the Comanches. Remember now, this is winter, this is September, they, they decides to organize. It's not quite winter yet, but it will be before he gets going. Um, this gets classified as a punitive mission which means they're gonna kill everybody, bring no prisoners back. This is what they're gonna teach the Comanches. Um, by November, he's finally ready and it's winter time. And so they head out, they head out uh, north of Austin. They find the Llano and the Colorado River. They started heading east. They skirt up the, the Pernanales. They go into the western part of the county. They're in San Saba. They're looking anywhere for these Indians and they can't find them anywhere. So how come these Indians can just disappear like this? And, um, you know, after you've been in a saddle for three weeks, you might get a little bit uh, perturbed with your, your leader or where is he taking us? What is he doing? Um, 
I don't know how many ultras they had from sitting in their saddle. If it was springtime, you could at least find some food along the way, but this is winter. These are the things that you could find in the summer. And wild peaches, there were wild peaches. Um, blackberries, of course, um, Mustang grapes ripen in August. Mm -hmm. Uh, September and you got wild plums in the spring. And I don't know what that other berry is anymore. But in the fall, you could look for persimmons. You could look for a tuna of cactus or maybe crab apples. Those all grew. The only thing likely that they found at this time is pecans. And so they find pecans and they find traces that the Indians have been hunting pecans. I don't know where they found some empty shells or whatever, but they find the, the trail that the that these two little stakes that you make. Okay, who's going to pronounce that word for me? A travoy? Is that? Trava? Okay. I guess that's French. I don't know. They find these and that begins to, to lead them into the upper Colorado. And it is winter, it is cold, it is snowing, and um, they finally locate them where they are. And this is where they are. And I've been there. Um, I wish I had a pointer, but I, I can't. Do you see the top of the photograph? Uh, just a little bit to the right of center, you see a bend. That's, that's where they're camped. That's their winter encampment. Colorado City is off to the, to the right. And I've, I've walked all the way up there to that exact spot. Once again, Moore and his men find them. They tie up all their horses, and at dawn, they attack the camp. It's surprising. Catch them off guard this time. Get past all the guards. They do have a surprise attack, and it is pure slaughter. <laughs> they're, they're killing everybody that they can. They, some of the Comanches um, flee into the, you know, try to swim across the river. It's not very deep. The bluff's not very high on the other side. I think only two or three managed to escape. They kill almost everything. The problem with um, photographs like this or rendering is number one, nobody was on horseback. So that's not, uh, that's not true. Nobody has pistols like that because those pistols had one shot one shot only. So there's no way he's running around like a six shooter shooting, shooting constant like that. And the Indians aren't on horseback either. They catch them flat handed and I don't know how they manage to do that, but they, they, they do. Um, Gillespie gets a little PR out of this. Um, I don't know if this is true or not, but there was some of the early books I was reading, they're, they're so prolific in praise. It's, it's almost, a, it's, it's really amazing that they even got printed. But um, it was the way things were done there. They kill 124 Comanches. They run out of things to kill them with. I mean, <laughs> one shot, two pistols, that's all you got, and one rifle. It takes about a minute to reload a rifle. So if this is going on, you got to really watch to see who's coming at you while you're trying to load your gun. So I don't know how many got reloaded. They finally have to stop and they captured 34. Most of them are, are squaws and, and young girls and, um, and chiefs, uh, old, two chiefs that are too old to, to escape. Two people are known to escape and uh, word gets out on that. Robert and his brother get to divide all the loot. This was common practice. So they, they get, they load up with buffalo hides, as many as they can carry. They burn the rest. They, they get all the Linville grocery stuff, everything that was, thing. they get to keep all that. So this was like, if you rob a bank and you got the money and you caught the bank robber, you get the money. You got to keep that. Didn't really sit too well with the merchants down in Linville, but that was the way it was done. And they made a haul. Uh, I don't know what a horse was worth in those days, but um, it was a lot. This is the only marker that, that, that marks the biggest massacre of Indians in Texas. And it's, it's hardly ever publicized and it's kind of sad. But that's where it took place. I, I searched a lot of the records that were online. And uh, records like this would first notice the date, I think, is 1851 or 8. The, the reason these documents appear so much later is people who inherited money or the state didn't pay, they had to prove that they were, yes, Captain Gillespie was in this unit. He did fight in this. 
And so that's how the state would pay a lot of their claims. Apparently, Gillespie was too rich to cash in his vouchers. He just didn't draw. Uh, he was salaried by the general land office in the Republic of Texas, but he just never really drew his salary. It was kind of kind of interesting. Um, after this took place, the, the official rangers finally get started uh, as organized. And there was um, a, a Mark B. Lewis, who was an early Texan, and he, he starts a company out of Travis County. And Gillespie decides to sign up with him. Now, his brother, Matthew Milton, has had enough, says, I'm not going. And I don't know what happened to Matthew Milton. Nobody knows. But he just vanishes from, from history book. Um, this guy, Mark B. Lewis, was a character. Look what he said about his men. I don't understand all that. Now, Gillespie's elected a, a first lieutenant, so it tells us that, that he's popular with, with his men, that he's a, a leader. And he's not too happy with running around with, with um, what's his name, Green, in, in, in West Texas. So he kind of heads back to, um, to Fayetteville. And we, we jump ahead to 1842. And if you know Texas history, you know San Antonio was invaded twice in 1842, the second time by, by this general, um, Adrian Wool. And I just kind of put in what San Antonio might have looked like in those days. Um, the ranger that was charged in watching out over San Antonio was, was, was Captain Hayes. And he staked out on the southwest portion of San Antonio waiting for anybody to come up um, from the Laredo and the, um, the Mexican general skirts him and they fool, they fool him and they capture San Antonio. So um, it wasn't a good sign. The mayor of San Antonio at this time is, is Juan Seguin. Ever heard of him? Town of Seguin's named after him. He was uh, actually a state senator in the Republic. He was now mayor. And it was unfortunate that, that he, was in, he was in office at the time because he's captured by, by Wool. And uh, he's eventually taken prisoner and hauled back to Mexico. And then the rest of Texas just declare him a traitor as well. So he can't ever come back. Um, they, the, there are dozens of San Antonio citizens that, that are captured and taken back and forced to retreat when he has to retreat. But first, Wool is taking a look at Texas and he's caught, he's caught the Rangers by surprise. He's captured San Antonio and he wants to head east a little way. While news is getting out, Hayes managed to run through the hill country and um, meet him on the northeast side. Uh, word is getting out. There's another captain called Codwell. And a battle takes place at Salado Creek. Gillespie hears about this. And he's a member of the Fayetteville uh, Rangers, but he takes out and tries to, to come to the rescue of San Antonio. And of course, um, there's a battle that take place. It takes place at Salado Creek. Um, Gillespie's involvement is that he is charged with trying to draw out the Mexican cavalry. He's a good horseman. And so they send him to this place. This place doesn't exist anymore, but it's just east of the Alamo where this tower stood. It's an armory where they record things. And it's an open field there. And he's sent out and he does all kind of horsemanship with some other um, handy horsemen. And they say, come on, cavalry, come on out. Come on, chase us. And what they're trying to do is bring them back over to the Salado Creek where the rest of the Texans are collecting an ambush. And so this is where the Battle of Salado Creek takes place. It works. Gillespie's, Gillespie and the other rangers are able to draw the cavalry out. And the cavalry is, is really pretty awesome. But um, when you're in a shrub like that and you're shooting at somebody in a protective uh, place, it's it's not, not good if you're on horseback. So the other fellow that um, the, the Dawson, Dawson from LaGrange, uh, Gillespie was part of this company. Um, they arrive at the battle at the wrong place at the wrong time. And they're all captured and, and shot by the Mexicans. So that's where the Dawson massacre took, took place. I'm going through a lot of Texas history, so you may need to refresh that. But um, well, after this, um, it was, it was, Wool decides, maybe I need to leave. These Texans are just a little bit too ambitious for me. And so he collects a lot of citizens and um, 
we don't know how many cavalrymen he lost. There are all kinds of estimates on, on the damage that, that he lost, but he lost significant numbers. Um, nobody can trust the numbers. And so um, they start chasing wool. He's made it heading back to Laredo. The problem is the Texans are totally, the Texans themselves are just totally um, bewildered. They can't get organized. There's nobody that wants to be in charge. There's too many people in charge. And so nothing happens. And so um, some of the Rangers follow uh, the Mexicans in Hondo, outside of Hondo, Gillespie actually is involved in seizing a cannon. But then they, you know, he loses it again. Um, there's a Captain Hayes who, number one, basically screwed up the whole thing to begin with and allowed Wool to, to swing around him, likes what he sees in Hayes and uh, in Gillespie. And Hayes invites Gillespie to join, join his company. So this, this is now when Gillespie and Hayes are in the same company. And again, he's a leader and he's elected first lieutenant. And now he's based in, in, um, in Bear County. Well, Houston is the president of Texas again. And everybody wants to go to war with Mexico and Texas is not prepared for war. And so Houston has a, has a problem. How do we keep everybody who wants to go to war with Mexico quiet, says calm down. Okay, I'm doing this, I'm, we're gonna go get them. Um, how do you do that? It's a, it's a, you gotta find the right kind of person or the right kind of idiot to be in charge. And he finds this guy, Alexander Somerville. He was a hero of the revolution, but he gives some specific instructions. You do not go to Mexico. Do not invade Mexico. I don't care what you tell all your men. Says, yeah, we're going to do it. We're going to get armed. We're going to be loaded up. 700 people show up in San Antonio. Then stationed at all the little missions around town. They're organizing. They're getting all their equipment together. Um, they, they want to go invade Mexico. And it would have been a disaster for the Republic of Texas to have another war. So Houston, has, Houston is, is in a quandary. And um, it's, it's difficult to keep everybody pacified. Guess what? It's getting to be winter again. Um, Houston uh, asks Hayes. Captain Hayes is not part of the Somerville expedition. He is the, uh, still captain of the, Hay of the Texas Rangers. He orders them to, to accompany Somerville. And so Somerville takes his time. He's, he's ordered to. And um, he's ordered to delay, stop, you know, just take your time. You've got to you gotta have a, a fiesta tonight, or you gotta go hunting, or you gotta clean your rifles. You need to do something, just take your time. So October passes into November and it's getting cold again. And guess what? The Texans haven't learned their lessons yet about taking campaigns. I guess going south to Mexico, they expect it to be warmer, but they're concentrating at the San Jose mission. And Somerville is just basically out of ideas. How do I stop everybody? How do I keep everybody, you know, kind of happy and not revolting? So he finally says, okay, let's head for the border, but do so at a slowest pace you can possibly do. If you want to read a really good book about all of this, um, Dr. Joseph Milton Nance was the chairman of my history department when I was at A&M. This guy wrote two books on Texas history. It took him a lifetime. They're this thick, um, but the, he has every detail in it. And um, you can't, well, if you want to, to buy a book like this it used to cost you $500. So see if it's online somewhere, rent it from a library. Uh, this, this book is fantastic. This guy didn't miss a detail on anything. Um, he, is, he was really, really good, but he lays out all the detail, of everything that happens. And of course, they're heading south. Remember Black Northerners? I don't know if y'all you know, didn't grow up here in the 50s, but Black Northerners rolled in and we said, wow, we're finally going to get some rain. We're in the middle of a seven year drought and it's all dust and it gets cold. And that's what happened. Um, the north wind is blowing in. There's snow everywhere. They're traipsing through. They Texans just can't seem to learn their lesson at all. They have no blankets. And um, the illustration on the right is the one the horses sank up to their knees. Um, so they had to dig out the horses. The whole ground was just a quagmire. Um, you ever read a book called The Sea of Mud? It's a fantastic book about what happened to Santa Ana at, at, um, at 
what is the battle that took place in East Texas or in one independence? San Jacinto. Yeah, San Jacinto. There are two Mexican armies surrounding Houston. And of course, Santa Ana surrenders and they're wanting to come to the aid. They're gonna, they mean they have a they have they're huge. And Santa Ana sends for it, says, go back, just quit, it's all over, go home. And these generals, one of them is, I think, German, says, oh, you can go stupid there, but okay. Well, when they turn around, it starts raining. And the Sea of Mud describes their retreat. Their horses sink to their bellies. Horses drown in mud. They lose cannon. They, the whole Mexican army disintegrates hundreds, I mean, dozens of, of soldiers die and drown and freeze to death. It is really amazing. Sea of mud, fabulous reading. Um, but that's what happened here. Somebody wrote a little poem about this. I guess the troops, at least they were marching south to sing songs. Well, Laredo's not that far from San Antonio, but it took them forever trying to, to get there. And it's still along by December the 6th, they're still 60 miles outside of Laredo and they're freezing to death. This is where Gillespie runs into Samuel <coughs> Hamilton Walker, who's just been freed from Mexico. He runs back to, to Texas. He runs to join Somerville's army. And he's, he's just gung-ho. Um, he becomes Gillespie's best friend. They're good, they're good, but he's, he's, in, he's in Somerville's army. But they become spies, they're just scouting, they, they, they seek boats along the river for transporting uh, troops across the river. But Somerville has instructions not to cross the Rio Grande. And he's got a lot of men under his command and they're itching to cross the border. And of course, if you remember Mir, uh, Texas history, you know, this is where Mir takes place, the, the revolt and Somerville takes his army and heads home. And Walker, of course, wants to invade Mexico and he's part of the, the Mir expedition. And we know what happened to that. They're captured, they're marched back into, into Mexico. And so um, we know that Robert Gillespie was associated with this because of this document that I found online. Again, on, these are available online, you can find it. And this is what this one says, because there's lots of rumors about how, what was Robert Gillespie's real name. And this is an affidavit that Gillespie was known as A. Period Gillespie and R. A. Period, uh, Gillespie that he was called by his friend A.D.D. Gillespie, that he was never just A.D. Gillespie, that he was never known as Addie, and he was never known as Richard. And I point that out because you'll find many documents in which all oh, they're writing the history and they'll use the incorrect, so they have an incorrect name for him. So he's either A or R.A. or A.D.D. And, um, it, I just thought that was kind of interesting. Gillespie's now at home in San Antonio, um, probably for all the reasons. This is an 1847 photograph of the Alamo. Uh, they're kind of hard to find. I put 1844 on it because that's where he's living, but it's 1847. It's, it's neat to look at those. Um, you see some guys standing against the wall. The, the dome is gone. Um, but that's San Antonio at the time that, that Gillespie's, Gillespie's there. And their job for the next two years is just to patrol South Texas, to patrol the area, look for Comanches, look for anybody coming up uh, from the valley, uh, looking for outlaws. Hayes is a killer. He holds, he captures somebody, he'll hold a trial and execute him. He is a killer. I don't know how many they kill, but they do that. There is no law and order uh, with them. So I don't know. Um, whether Gillespie was involved in executions, but definitely John Hayes was. Um, so now there's news again. This is just, just some of the banditos that are running down in the area. Um, newspapers are full of it all the time. Um, they patrol the area to the north, they patrol the area to the south, and they, uh, they take a special look to the area to the north and back on the Pinta Trail, because what's happening in 1844 is Houston is president again, and he is trying to hammer out a peace treaty with all the Indian tribes. 
And really they're thinking about maybe giving a whole swath of area um, to the Indians as their reservation or whatever, but he doesn't want anything to happen that would upset the peace talks and getting the Comanches to sit down in the peace talk is really, really difficult. So Houston sends word to, to, um, to Hayes, says, keep it quiet. I don't want any, front, any problems. So um, the Pinta Trail is important because Hayes does take about 15 of his rangers and they head up to the Llano just to scout around to see what's happening. Um, they're just to find out if anything's going on. Now Hayes has been a loyal ranger, but how long can you serve without getting paid? And so every once in a while he goes to visit his friend Sam Houston and he gets on his horse and he gallops over. He says, okay, Sam, when are you gonna pay us? When are you gonna get the Congress to pay, uh, pay us some money? And um, well, Sam Houston has a hard time with that. And so um, here's the reason why Hayes can do that. Um, he came to Texas with a letter of introduction from Andrew Jackson himself and Sam Houston and Andrew Jackson are, are thicker than thieves. So um, there's no money to give him anymore. And so what he gives them, he says, you can have the Patterson Colt. And of course, um, Hayes is saying, what's a Patterson Colt? Um, it's um, a pistol and it's in a warehouse. It's in Galveston. And Houston says, I can't pay you, but you can go get them. So um, the Rangers are desperately short of money. They don't really have enough to pay anybody. Gillespie goes back home uh, to, to Fayetteville. But these are the pistols that, um, that, that, Walter, that Hayes finds in this warehouse in Galveston. And I brought one up. It's really a beautiful pistol. Take a look at all the things that, that are in there. Um, this course was the deluxe model with, with the kit. Um, this is the pistol stripped down. This is, um, this is the, this is the um, first Colt that Samuel Colt ever made. Anything wrong with that pistol? There's no trigger. Not only that, you're trying to cock it to get the trigger out is almost impossible. Remember that photograph with those rangers right around shooting? Yeah, That's right. impossible. And yet I have found so many documents where they have the rangers doing exactly that. Um, when fully cocked, it does fire. This is a replica, it was made in Italy and you're welcome to take a look at it. Um, I left the, the balls at home and of course I don't, I don't have any caps for it. But the things that they write about this pistol are absolutely wrong. Number one, you can't fire it with one hand. It takes, it takes two, hand, two hands to fire it. You can't fire it on, on, on horseback because I, I, I don't know why Colt did a, 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 a pistol like this. It just boggles my mind. Number one, to, to reload it. And I found so many descriptions of where they're reloading. And most of these, if you go back, and look at this kit, there are two cylinders. See that cylinder in the upper right-hand corner? That is a spare cylinder. So you could load it and have it maybe in your pocket. The problem is taking this pistol apart in order to do that. And I have accounts with them doing it on horseback and that is totally false. Number one, you need a screwdriver and that's where you had to have this thing. And so you're fumbling around for that on your horseback. And then you're supposed to undo the screw. And then when you do that, you can hammer out the little wedge. Then the pistol came apart. Then you could slip off this cap and put in the new pistol. And you're still joshing around. These people are idiots. So you can take a look at that. And I went through all this. I said, that account can't, that account helps no water. It can't be accurate. It's an interesting weapon, but it, it's, it's, it was the beginning of the, it's a five shot pistol, by the way. And it was the first time that, that it was ever, it will ever be used in any kind of battle. And it saved Samuel Cole. So um, some people described it as delicate, dainty and dainty, uh, but it was not a weapon to use outside 
you know, in a fight. And Hayes is trying to figure this out. So he can't get paid by the Republic. He has all these pistols and he's thinking and thinking, how on earth can I make them work? And he's thinking all the way through it. And the only thing he can think of is this, all right, you're gonna to have to fire this thing at point blank range. Pistols are highly inaccurate. You ever shoot a pistol? I mean, they're really inaccurate. So unless you get about this far away, maybe about that far, um, they're really ineffective because you're gonna miss. And he calls that powder burning. Don't fire them until you're close enough to powder burn. Now, I don't know exactly how Hayes tried to figure out when you're facing a Comanche charging you with a 10 foot spear that you're supposed to wait until you can point that 18 inches from, from their head or their body. But that's what he trains his men to do. And the discipline that he instills on his men is unbelievable, but he has to be thinking about this. At least that's my, that's my thought about it. He has to think through, how can I make this weapon do anything that it's supposed to do? And so he comes up, I think he comes up with that theory, and it is my, my theory, nobody else has ever heard my theory before. So if you leave the room, you're taking the theory with you. Um, I'm pretty, pretty confident about it. So Hayes is on patrol with 15 other Rangers. He has, the company's about 70 when it's fully strength in Bear County, but he takes only a few with him and he selects Gillespie to go with him. And they head up to the Llano River. Um, some say they saw all kinds of signs of Comanche or Indians but they don't really find him at all. Uh, according to other sizes, Hayes says he didn't see any. He's about in the area of Sisterdale, as, as, as far as I can surmise. How am I doing on time? I think I kept everybody two hours last time. I'm sorry about doing that. I can speed it up even more. But um, there's a place that became known as Walker's Creek. I don't know where Walker's Creek is. I think it's at Sisterdale. It sure looks like Sisterdale. Um, you can go on all kinds, there's no Walker Creek in Texas, whether you put apostrophe in it or without it, it just isn't. Uh, so I really think it's Sister Creek. Um, you've been to Sisterdale? It's really pretty, lots of cypress, huh? Yeah, that's where I think it took place, this fight took place. He has 15 men, suddenly he's surrounded by 75 Comanches. Now how he let 75 Comanches slip up, up, in, up on him is kind of, is kind of, questionable in itself. So I'm not sure there are 75 because it Comanches usually when in uh, when they the chiefs took their their squads out with them was about 15 young warriors and they could go on trading mission for 75 to be together. This is an invasion. And so uh, I really question all that, but that's what the story is. Um, so he finds that he's being followed and he's, he's got 75 on his tail. And so the only thing they could do is, is, um, is, to, is to get on horseback and let's try to kind of ease our way out of the hill country. Um, he has the Indians are smart enough to know how far they need to stay away from the Texans rifles. They know exactly to the foot. So they're not gonna come any closer where a long rifle can be fired and kill one of them. And so it becomes a jockeying match. How are they going to do this? Meander. Once the wrong rival has been fired, then they knew they can attack because they didn't know about this, these little pistols repeating themselves. And that's what the whole thing, thing happened. And um, Hayes does position his men and they do try to shoot. We don't know how many uh, they get on that first round. There are a total of, I think, 15 um, Comanches killed in this fight. And the other thing you have to understand about Comanches, Comanches did not commit war in the European fashion. Uh, you see the American GIs or the GIs landing at Normandy and it's man after man you just, that got killed on the beaches. They don't fight that way. That's stupid. If one or two Indians got killed, they got the hell out of there. They don't want to try some other way to do this. So um, Hayes needs to kill as many as he can. Uh, the Indians apparently do regroup. 
They now know that all the long rifles have been supposedly fired and shot. So the, the, the Comanches are vulnerable. This is how the story goes. Uh, Hayes gets all his horses, what we call rump to rump. So you have a little circle in all directions. And uh, he instructs his men. And what he teaches them is not to fire until they can pound a bird. And that's pretty damn close. And that's what supposedly happened here at this fight. And this is, this is Hayes' words. This is how he describes it, it to, after, after the fight to, to Mary Maverick. And he said, those pistols did good execution. They worked the way I had theorized them to do. And Hayes is suffering casualties too. If you take five casualties, that's 30%. The first encounter, that first little round that they had, Hayes has five men on the ground. One of them is Gillespie. Gillespie and Walker have both been in the, what they call run through. I'm not sure what that means, but usually with a spear, you just run through somebody. Um, it's unclear because um, the Comanches are definitely stunned by the fire coming at them. And they, one of the chief, one of the persons later is quoted. He had fire coming out of each of his fingers, so they know that those weapons are shooting more than one time. They know it. They're not stupid. Um, anyway, supposedly Hayes calls out, "Did any of you guys have a rifle left?" And guess who raises his hand? Good old Gillespie says, "I do." Now he's been run through. And you would think one of his fellow rangers would take the rifle away. Let me do that. No, they help him off his horse, put him on a rock, and he takes aim. Now he's got one shot left out of all of the rangers left. If he misses, what do you think those Comanches are going to do? Well, nobody knows. But anyway, Gillespie sends the one ball that he has left through, according to the scriptures here, right through the Indian. And of course, when the chief falls off the saddle, the rest of them skedaddle. Um, that's the fight that took place at Sisterdale. I've written a whole book on it. <laughs> this is the fight on Walker's Creek. Um, it's available on Amazon if you want to um, waste whatever money is involved in looking at that. But um, the other thing I wanted to point out is, is um, the footnotes that are in, in books. This book that was so acclaimed by, the, by everybody has two full pages of bibliography. And they're really hard to find. Um, take a look. This book has a whole lot more bibliography. Uh, five pages of bibliography. That's, that's pretty good. I want to show you the bibliography that I had. See where the marker is? That's all the, the sources I, I looked at, and I dug up everything. I've been at this since 19, um, I don't know when I started, but a long time. And so I have a lot of sources, and I document everything. Anyway, this, this is what happened. Um, Mary Maverick, ever heard of her? Samuel Mac Maverick in San Antonio? Big revolutionary hero there in San Antonio. You know the whites, the Anglos are moving into into San Antonio. They obviously have money, but Mavericks were were quite influential. I think he was mayor of San Antonio uh, for a while. Mary is um, Captain Hayes' friend, and so a few days later, he tells her he tells her supposedly this, but she writes this twenty years later. So you wonder how much of it is really true. Again, they're doing execution that the, that the pistols perform. Um, and what he admits, they were almost out of, out of all the shells that they had. So um, Walker, um, after, after, the, after the Mexican War, uh, yeah, during the Mexican War, goes to New York. And he looks up Samuel Colt and he says, hey, Colt, you need to improve this thing. And let me give you some suggestions. Number one, a trigger guard would really be nice, <laughs> you know? And you know, it only has five shots. How about adding six shots? I'm, that's where the six, this is not a six, six shooter. Anyway, he meets Samuel Colt and Samuel Colt is bankrupt at that time. He says, hey, thanks a lot for those ideas. And he starts manufacturing the the, um, the, uh, the six shooter. And the, the cylinder that's on this gun, which is really incorrect, Dick has the fight that takes place at Walker Creek. 
So it never appeared on this one, but it did appear on the, the Walker coat. He names it after Samuel Walker. Samuel Walker never gets his coat. They're shipped to Mexico while he's still in Mexico, but he's killed before he has a chance to, to do that. There is a German involved in, in, in this on the 15 men that went up. You never hear anything about him because he was a stupid German because he got himself killed. Um, Peter Four. And he, he had part of it, he was owned, he owned part of a bar in San Antonio. I don't know how he got to be a ranger, but he decided to become a ranger. He is from Germany. Um, and um, the other little thing that's popping up now is, um, all right, how do you pronounce that? Nativism? Um, ever heard of that? You are brighter than I am. <laughs> anyway. Um, Hayes admits that almost everybody was wounded at this fight. It was a close call. He's lucky to get out of it a lot. He, he was totally surrounded, totally outnumbered. Um, everybody, everybody has some kind of wounds on him. Well, I don't know the definition of run through, whether it's a spear, but this is the definition they use. Now, Walker is severely run through. He spends weeks in, 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 in the care of this lady in San Antonio. I'm not even going to pronounce her last name, um, but um, she and her husband were good friends of the Mavericks, but she ran kind of a, um, a hospital. And so if you were wounded, you got to stay with her. And she, she took care of Walker and, and, and Gillespie and so that, that's kind of an interesting thing on that. Well, the Mexican War breaks out and Hayes is, is promoted to a colonel. And so Gillespie gets to take over Hayes. He is now a captain. And the entire Rangers volunteer for the war. Everybody volunteers for the war. Let's go, except Gillespie is stuck in San Antonio, but he's doing all the reports now. And if you go online, you can see his signature. It's a fabulous signature. He does that without picking up the pen. You can retrace all those letters in that whole name. He must have, he was obviously well-educated. I'd like to see I mean, if he would have only written, he wrote one letter to his sister that still exists in his handwriting. We have a new president at this time, President Polk. Um, Polk was an interesting character and he wants a war with Mexico. And obviously his agents have been trying to, to foster some kind of war. This is Taylor's camp at, at um, Corpus Christi. And of course, um, they're trying to provoke the Mexicans into a war, but you gotta shoot first. You know, we don't wanna start it, you gotta do it. And um, it's kind of a standoff and it's kind of interesting. Um, the artists have a field day with the uniforms. Notice everybody's dressed in their bed. These are wool uniforms. They're really great to, to invade Mexico in your wool uniforms, but um, they, they do exist. This is a real photograph for Dara Jack. Um, I love looking at these, these faces of these men. Uh, to kind of tell you a lot, that this is, this, and that was kind of semi-colored. Uh, they're proud of their uniforms. These are army um, officers or army, or army privates. Here's another guy. This one kind of a frontiersman. Um, got two, two braces, two pistols in his belt. Um, I don't know if that's a shotgun or what that is, but everybody is itching for war. And of course, the courier and I have the, the more idealistic image. Um, life in the army is no fun. Uh, you got to cook your own meals. It's not fun at all. Uh, we have some real photographs. This was taken in Mexico. Um, not very many. Um, I don't know if this is Monterey or, or where it is, but um, even my army band went to war. Imagine that. And so they had a they could have parades. This one is a little more telling. Being in the army is no fun. I want you to look at those guys that are kneeling and they have their knees drawn up. They have their wrists tied in front of their knees. And if you look under the knees, you'll see a pole that runs under all of their knees and right above their elbows. That's how they sometimes kept for 24 hours or more. It was horrible what the army did. 
I don't know why anybody would volunteer for that, but they're going to see all these volunteers, especially the Rangers who are in all kinds of uniforms and doing all kinds of things. This was not much fun, but the, the, the call to arms across the United States was unbelievable. Everybody wants to be in the war. Um, said what, 73,000 volunteers, volunteers to go into this. They're running ads, everybody, all the states are forming companies. If you wanna be captain, you just advertise for men and you got a company and then you're off to war. Volunteers are require, recruited everywhere. Um, this is more an idyllic photograph. I don't think anybody really looked like that. I mean, that, you'd have to do that in the 1900s. I mean, in the 20th century. Um, rarely seldom that they looked like that. This is more typical. Um, just anything that you could, could manage to wear. Um, a lot of people protect, portray the range, rangers as being most villainous, I mean, most evil persons on earth. Um, not the most attractive people you like to have as your neighbors. Um, this is John Hayes, but did a nice rendering of him. Um, uh, more idealistic. This is what they really look like, according to some people. I don't know that anybody, I never saw a photograph like this. This is a drawing. Here's another good book that you might want to read. Uh, it's, it's really, really good. It's called Rackensackers, um, The Conquest of Northern Mexico. Uh, got the, it's on, you have to read it on, online. It's, it's really good because it's written in, in recently. And it gives you a different slant of what the Texas volunteers were like. Now, it'd be a mistake to call all the 7,000 volunteers as rangers. And that's where most people make the biggest blunder. Um, news from the front was, was, was quite recent. There were all kinds of reporters that were sending news stories back to New Orleans. Um, going from, the, from New Orleans and New Orleans Picune, uh, it traveled up the Mississippi and got, it could get into all parts of the United States within two weeks. They were, they were crazy for news about what was happening in the war. So you see this kind of like this, I know you've seen this painting of reading news from the front and everybody's excited about it. There were other things that were, had happened in the United States that, that changed the image. One of them was the first great awakening. You ever heard of that? It's like revivals, and they would have revivals, church camps, and everybody is, is getting young ho about learning everything about the Bible. So the United States is, is undergoing a lot of transformation since the, uh, the war with England. Um, the other thing that's happening is Native Americans is, is um, something to be aware of the immigrants coming to the United States. And Americans were upset about the number of immigrants. And it was, it was kind of shocking to them because number one of them, a lot of them were Catholic. And the, the anti-Catholic attitude in the United States was, was just overwhelming. These are political cartoons that appeared at the time. The Pope is gonna take over the colonies in the United States. Look at the number of Catholics coming over. And now there's a war with Mexico. We're gonna fight Catholics was, was, was a real issue that a lot of people supported. Uh, we can't have Texas be Catholic. We can't let this impression keep going like that. This is a sizable number. Um, remarkably, Gillespie's company had two, had four Catholics. And these were, they were even Hispanics, um, Tejanos, whatever you want to call them. These, all four of these, two of these will actually accompany Gillespie into, into Mexico. Well, here's the battle plan. I'm trying to wrap this up really quickly. I don't want to keep you, but um, you can see Gillespie is in San Antonio. He's going to head back to Laredo, a city that he captured for the United States. Taylor is down at, at Madame Morris. He's going to go up river because there's no really direct route to Monterey, and they've got to take the war into Mexico. President Polk is getting really fed up with, with, with Taylor because he's not doing anything. It's this month. This is the first battles take place in May. Monterey doesn't happen until September. Lots of idle hours in all those times. Again, we have Curry and Ives that, that draw the idyllic photographs of the war that people get. And here's, you can see a close up of the route. Uh, Madame Morris, the easiest way to get to Monterey is go up river. 
uh, to Comaro, I probably mispronounced that too, and then head over to Monterey. Monterey is where the Mexican army has withdrawn. Taylor finally gets there. And again, you have this beautiful rendering. You never show the volunteers showing up first, but you have the regular army standing before Monterey and Monterey is opening. And Monterey is neat. Y'all ever been there? It's, it's a beautiful city. I love Monterey. I think the first time I went to Monterey was in 1969 in the La Louisiana restaurant down on the square. I just loved it. Anyway, um, the interesting thing, about, interesting thing about the army is they've got all these volunteers and the volunteers know nothing about drilling. They, need not, they know nothing about you know, maneuvering to take a site. So I know the US Army had to figure out, you know what, we're just gonna send them up there first and see who's left standing. And so you never see the volunteers um, leading the path like that. You always see the uniformed guys. This is um, Taylor's camp out of side of Monterey. And um, Gillespie is assigned to uh, General Worth. General Worth was really, really upset when General Taylor was appointed Supreme Commander. He's so mad he quits and heads back. Fort Worth named after him. And then he finds out that maybe this is an opportunity. So he kind of sneaks back into the army, but he never gets into General Taylor's good graces. So anyway, they have to share command. And so Taylor selects General Worth to take his army and head over to one side of Monterey. Monterey has these huge mountains around it. So here's the battle plan. Um, they divide their forces. So if you look at the upper, the north, whatever that is, right-hand side up there. Uh, Taylor is going to go straight south and, and try to attack Monterey uh, from the east, and he's going to send um, Worth, Worth um, to the west side. And the first thing they do, they're going to cut off the Saltillo Road. See the Saltillo Road down there at the bottom? Uh, they need to cut off the escape route heading uh, to Mexico. And every night, um, Gillespie is called on to do reconnaissance. And he, he teams up with like, like, like Meade, Lieutenant Meade, who's out of West Point, will become the Supreme Commander during the Civil War. He knows all those West Point officers and he's called to, to, to guide them on reconnaissance night after night. Gillespie has no time to, to, really, to really sleep. So um, the first role that Gillespie McCullough have to do is cut off the the road. Uh, the second thing they do, they're going to try to seize Federation Hill, which is to the south of Monterey. And Gillespie scales the mountain. He is the first man into Fort Soledad. Did I pronounce that correctly? And everybody knows he's the first one. He's standing on top. Look, I'm the first one. He hops in and everybody who raised and he's, he's recognized for his, his guts, I guess. I mean, it's really stupid, but it, it is. Um, so you see, you see Federation Hill at the bottom on the BNU South, um, whatever side, west side. Uh, see Fort Soledad. He captures that. At night, they go back across the river to camp. And the next day you see Child's army, they're going to head up that way. I love these maps because they don't point any rangers. All these army officers came in after the rangers. So if you look at every name on there, those are all regular army people. And they never mentioned the rangers, but you see Child's, uh, that's where Gillespie is. He's leading the charge the next morning and all the volunteers. And I guess volunteers, because they're so undisciplined, they just go at it. And they're screaming and yelling and they hate Mexicans to begin with. So, you know, um, if the regular army people said, let them do that, um, that's what they do. Their mission is to take the Independence Hill and you see, you see, um, okay, I'm not gonna pronounce that. The, uh, the, the, the word beginning with O, that's, that's the church that's on top of that hill. And on the 22nd, the Rangers are the first to climb the hill. And you see it's called the Bishop's Palace. And that's the goal. See the redoubt up there? Gillespie's the first to jump on that redoubt. This time, he's not so lucky. And he takes a gut shot. And everybody knows a shot in the belly is Doomsville. And so they take him um, away. To, to raise survives the whole day. The rest of the, the hill is taken. Um, this is what it looks like today. I've, I've been all over um, 
Monterey, I've been on all the hills uh, in, in the city, you can't even see it. It's not really very big, um, but it was important at the time. And on the east end stood this Bishop's Palace and they bring Gillespie back there the next morning. And to be, the first they take him back down the hill because uh, Taylor uh, Worth doesn't want anybody to, to, he wants to listen to music with the band. So he has his band up here the night. The next morning he says, okay, bring all the wounded up. So they bring Gillespie back up into the Bishop's Palace and he expires there um, in the morning. And um, of course it's a fatal wound. There are a lot of illustrations uh, of, my, of um, the Bishop's Palace. Um, this was taken in the 70s. The remarkable thing is still a cannon laying in the foreground. Um, Bishop's Palace had been abandoned for quite some time. This is the courtyard inside. It's probably where Gillespie expired. They, um, he dies around sunrise. All his men are really sad. All this is his, his buddies, especially uh, Walker, is, is that's his best friend. Um, meanwhile, the fighting takes place by the uniformed officers and you don't see anything, but the Rangers are the ones that swept down the streets. They're the ones that taught the, we want to call them Yankees, how to fight house to house. They learned that when they were capturing San Antonio back in the 1835 in the Revolutionary War. So these scenes all take place later. Um, there's a lot of bloody fighting, a lot of, I mean, they fought house to house. The Texans show them how to, to go through a wall instead of you know, getting out in the street, just go through the walls. And, uh, they're vicious, but you always see these um, Curry and Ives illustrations. I stole a lot of images off the web because I didn't have any other sources on them. So um, they decide to bury Hill, uh, Gillespie on the hill um, and they even rename him Mount Gillespie. Um, so um, General Worth says, okay, we're gonna rename Independence and it's now Mount Gillespie. What is, guess what it's called today? Independence Hill. <laughs> so he lays all day wounded. Um, He's, he's a well-known figure in the press. Uh, the Picayune um, has articles about his, his exploits in Texas. Uh, he's making bylines. He's well-known. He's a name that's recognized outside of Texas in the United States. So they, it was newsworthy that he was, he was wounded and everybody, everybody knew it. Um, Governor Henderson, the guy I showed you in the beginning, says that about him. Everybody that dies is a gentleman. Um, they bring Gillespie back um, to San, or the, the notice in San Antonio of his death uh, really bothered, you know, really is sad. And then in Mexico, you know, you bury people, but then you don't watch them every day and they start digging up graves. And um, guess what? They dug up Gillespie's bones and scattered it and the dog struck off parts and that really upsets the Americans. How dare the Mexicans let this happen? We can't let this happen. Well, word gets back to Texas. And of course the people in San Antonio says, we got to bring the Lesby home. And so they do, they gather what's left and they bring him aboard this ship and it lands at New Orleans, Seymour, Alabama. And they unload there just with other, other bodies being brought back. Not many people were brought back from the Mexican war. Most of them were buried in Mexico, but if you had lots of money, you could do that. And so they did that for Gillespie. So he arrives on the Alabama, they have a parade through uh, downtown New Orleans and the band is playing and they have their services. And then they put all the bodies back on the ship and the ship sails up uh, to, um, to, to the east, but Gillespie obviously is going to Texas. So I imagine they put him aboard a, sh um, um, a stagecoach, but he finally gets to San Antonio and they bring him to San Antonio and they bury him. And um, lots of thoughts and news stories about, about him, about him arriving in New Orleans. Everybody wants to read about this, this true American, new Texan hero. And uh, they let you, the legislature names Gillespie County. Look how big Gillespie County was. See that upper Northeast corner right there? That's the outskirts of Mason, Texas. Uh, the whole entire Llano River is in the county. I love that. Even the even the Colorado um, flows through a part of part of the county. I don't know how we lost all that, and um, but anyway, that that's uh, that was the original county. Well, Sam Houston. I'm sorry, Samuel Walker. Um, 
example, is goes back to Mexico. He's now in the army. He is just as much of a daredevil as he's always been. And he's at the forefront of his, his um, men leading them into um, near, near Mexico City. And he's shot in the back by a dirty sniper from a cowardly from a rooftop. And of course, he has a great death. And he says, bury me with Gillespie. And they say, OK, we got to get him back. And so they're both buried together. They bring, they bring him back. And they're about the same age. They were the best of friends. They lie together in the tombstone. And they're buried in the Alamo outside on the grounds. And then the citizens of San Antonio said, you know, it's, we, we need to make an Alamo grounds here. So they dig him up and they rebury him over at the Oddsville Cemetery. And when they dig him up, there's an eight year old kid that was there and he's watching and he says, what are those charred bones from? And those are from the Texans that got burnt by Santa Ana. And so they scoop some of those up and they bury them in the Odd Fellow Cemetery. Well, in 19, it's not there, 19, God, forgotten when. There's a movement to take Sam, to take Sam Walker to Waco, to the Texas Ranger Museum. And so they sent a backhoe into the Oddfellow Cemetery and they're starting to dig up the grave. And guess who finds word of that? The Daughters of the Alamo. And so, well, what do you mean? Uh, and they raise holy hell, they get an injunction, the police show up, they surround everything, but they really open the grave and they're looking at the chart remains and it could be Alamo survivors or they could be Walker or they could be Gillespie and the court order stops it, they put them all back together and bury them. So Gillespie and, and Walker rest in peace. This is Gillespie's um, new tombstone that they have, the old one uh, is there. These are the people that we have photographs of that knew Gillespie well. Rufus Perry died in Johnson City. He moves up. Tia Thomas Jefferson Green stays in Fayette County. Ben McCullough dies in Arkansas in 1862. Samuel Walker, um, of course, we just went through his death. Kit Aiklin, um, I don't know what happened to him, but I think he was always a favorite. You've heard about Bigfoot Wallace. He was served with Gillespie too, supposed to be six foot six and wore size 16 shoes. And then there's Joe Tybee that Tybeedale and Kerrville is named after. And then John Hayes. Now John Hayes is an interesting character and it, I wish I had another life to and I would explore uh, what happened to him after the Mexican war because after the war, the frontier isn't what it used to be. Going out and shooting Indians and all this is not quite the same anymore. Texas is now a state and you got federal troops stationed at these ports like, like uh, what's our fort over here? Uh, Martin Scott and over at Mason. And so the glamor of, of shooting Indians isn't quite the same. So he heads to San Francisco and he's just in time for all the things that happen in San Francisco where they basically hang people on the spot. And I think if somebody did some research, he would have been at the forefront of all the things that were happening in San Francisco. Well, I'm sorry, folks, I'm out of time. I mean, that's, that's it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I hope it was entertaining to you. I've had a blast doing this. I'm still working on it. The reason it's taken me since 1996 to get this put together is because I do other things. And so I get to work on things. I haven't yet worked on this this year. I um, wanted to get this presentation. I had this ready to go two years ago. I kept tweaking it this morning. Um, it takes a while to do research. I don't know if I'll ever get the others published, but I'll have it documented. I'll have it ready. And I'm trying to get it online somewhere where other researchers probably can go and write a very short book uh, on, on Gillespie because he should be one of the most outstanding Texas Rangers ever. And um, unfortunately, that's not the case. So thank you for being patient. I see we lost some people. I hope it's been interesting. Um, questions? Okay, thank you. Zoom down if we did not. Yes. Book about the Comanches written by the Norwegian or whatever. Initials were PH. There was Fahrenbach who wrote one. What was the name of the other book? Remember? 
Let's see if I can find it. It's on that slide. Yeah. Something simple like. Wow, how far back was that? Oh, it was pretty far back. It was probably halfway through. It's kind of an aside that you were Yeah. About. Um, they were both right there together, the books, though, though. Fair, when we talked about Fahrenheit and then. Uh, right at the beginning. And his name was unpronounceable. One, yeah, I. I like Peter Hillman or something. I wish I somebody would. I can't remember that, but I thought if I had the name of the book. I, I think it has first of all, you should read Fahrenbach's book. Oh, I just went past it. I think it's the one with the. Oh, there we yeah. go. Hecka. Comanche Empire. Comanche Empire, stunning book, to be written by a guy from Finland. Um, I'm sorry I couldn't bring this one by Tab Thomas Cavanaugh is, is the third best book. This one's also good. Yeah, it, I meant failed to mention that. Do you um, do you use the legacy of Texas to re for some of your research? I just recently discovered that. No, I, so I'm not. I'm not sure I'm familiar with it. <coughs> Gold Star Union existence, <coughs> Civil War of Texas, and When I was in college, I did. Huh? Yeah. And I'm not. Red River Bridge War. No. I think that would be quite critical. I would definitely look at the bibliographies to see where they're getting their information. Yeah, yeah. Because there's so much hype in, in some of these that is not accurate. And they have a whole section on the Texas Rangers. Um, I need to, and I just discovered it about two weeks ago. The Rangers Live Legend and Legacy. That's not that. 3890. That's what I'm saying. Hey, I always buy used books. Yeah. I always look for used books because I mark them up. Yeah. Um, And a lot of these, I'm sure, I can browse and which I'll browse and see what I can find. Bye. Surely we can do some more of these. You're such a wonderful presenter. It's so much fun to listen to. Well, I, I thank you for your. I mean, really. I'm for your so comments, um, I wish I could do better. Fascinating. So, um, so interesting. I love teaching and. And you were a teacher Teach, for 18 years? 15 years. When you teach history, you have to bring it alive. Nice. And that's what I tried to do. I, I taught world history and American history. And I had a blast. I had kids just couldn't wait to find out to get to class. Yeah. Um, 